All right. So welcome to the Marine Researchers Breakout. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Giovanna, and she'll talk about how we could use your help. Yeah. So um, I'm sure you all heard from Kakani's presentation earlier. Um, so we, of course, are looking to gather more expertise, um, specifically any taxonomist or um, marine biologists and scientists to help um, with creating sort of uh, short video lessons um, about identifying taxonomic groups that are um, that they're most familiar with. And so we have this form here where you can get a little bit more information and sign up. But um, these videos will be hosted by Ocean Vision AI as a resource for users to learn more um, about uh, how to identify and classify specific marine animals. And so these videos can be um, pretty short in length from 15 um, up to 45 minutes. And basically it's in the hope that they can explain um, major morphological differences between certain groups and just to help people um, learn how to identify these animals. And so, um, you know, the videos can focus on higher level taxa, um, such as like the differences between classes, orders, or families, um, but they don't have to be, um, like like different species. And so, um, yeah, if you follow the link here, we could probably also put it in the chat. Um, you can get more information on how to sign up for those. And these videos would be publicly available. So um, they would be uh, stored in a, in a folder on like YouTube and serve as a resource for anyone who might be wanting to label, um, who might want to label data within FathomNet. Um, but also um, we're hoping to also uh, include these in, um, in Fathomverse in the game as well as another sort of um, resource for, for game players to use and to learn more about identifying animals. Um, and so again, it's just kind of a, having more resources available for people who are one labeling data within FathomNet and also um, for more people who want to learn a little bit more about different taxa groups. So if you are an expert in any, in any of, you know, these, um, um, I believe there's, I think in the, in the Google doc, there's a little bit more information, but there's like specific animal groups listed below um, in the sheet. And then you can kind of learn of which animals um, we need some, um, some taxonomic expertise on. So we're hoping to enlist the help um, of you all. So more information, I'll put the link in the chat. Just one sec. Giovanna, can I add a few things? Yeah. Um, I mean, I this this idea it's it's actually led by um, Brian Kennedy at ODL and uh, Karen Osborne, who's at uh, Smithsonian. And what we're recognizing is that um, we need, a, you know, a kind of a a resource for uh, people who are curious about or interested in in participating in a visual or uh, or, descript or describing or understanding uh, animal groups from visual data. Um, and so this is also an idea that's been uh, mentioned or kicked around by the Smarter ID group that's, um, that is uh, being led by uh, Carrie Howell at University of Plymouth, among others. And so what this, the goal of this is, is actually a collaboration between our two groups is to try and, and get members of our community to contribute their expertise, but then also sharing that broadly through kind of these video uh, content explainers. Um, but the idea as well is that this these explainers can be you know made broadly available and also could be a source of content that we push to the game as an award, right? So as game players are playing a game, they can hear from the experts um, how how would they ID animals or what make these animals really interesting or intriguing to a visual taxonomist. So um, really we're trying to pull together a lot of efforts from different groups that are interested in doing similar things uh, and then making this uh, content more broadly available. Great. So I think in in talking about how we might start off this uh, this breakout session, um, you know, we sort of landed on how do you see yourself using AI, and how can FathomNet help you uh, accomplish that goals those goals? What do you need from us to help you make this happen? And I thought what I'd do is just give you some concrete examples of how we're using this at Ambari. And so first of all, I'm going to talk about our Invari uh, VARS ML workflow. 
And I'll tell you about some of the tools that we've developed for localizing data and for processing data, processing data with these models, both in the cloud and locally, and then how we uh, validate those data. And then the next project I'm going to talk about is called Pisabore Cam, which is a neat project where we're actually just trying to identify ocean predators from long range AUV video. But first of all, I thought I'd start. So, uh, you know, hoping at this point, everybody knows what localized data is, but um, if you don't, you know, a normal annotation for us in the video lab is just, we saw these animals at this point in time on this frame from this dive. But localized video is actually where we've drawn boxes around the different classes that we need. And that's what's used for actually training these models. And for each model, we really need about a thousand examples of each one of these different classes. And so one of the first things that we developed was uh, called VARS Localize. Um, at Embari, we've got about 500,000 frame grabs from our 30,000 hours worth of video from the past 35 years. And we created VARS Localize as a tool that would allow us to quickly search for annotated concepts. We've got uh, about 10 million annotations in our VARS database. Um, and that's from, again, 35 years of people analyzing video and entering that information into a searchable database. Well, VARS Localize allows us to search those annotations for different concepts, pull up all those images, and then we can actually start localizing those and creating those training data sets. Once we have some of that training data, we upload that data to the cloud, um, where we use uh, fast GPU compute services, which are pretty cost effective. In fact, uh, Google uh, Colab is free, but you can use AWS or Google Cloud Compute. Um, we currently use uh, Ultralytics models, YOLO V5 and 8, but there's tons of models and frameworks out there that you can use for doing this work. The end result is once you've trained a model, you basically have a model weight file and you know, Kevin mentioned those are big. I think they're kind of small. They're like 158 megabytes. So easily shareable and pretty incredible that you can use them for doing this kind of work. So once we've got that model weight file, we can upload our video files or images that we want, analyze with that model weight file to the cloud. But you can also do this on your local desktop computer. And I'll show you an example of that in just a little bit. But anyways, we upload that model to the cloud, we upload our data to the cloud and process it um, using these fast GPUs. We retrieve those proposals and then with our VARS pipeline specifically, the proposals that we get are typically tracks. If it's still images, if it's still images, it's just single localizations for each image. But if it's uh, video, we're actually tracking those objects through space and time. And that type of annotation is not really appropriate for ingesting into our VARS database. So we filter those based on the highest confidence level for that object through its track. And then we import that into VARS. So for each one of those tracks that are through space and time, we just have one uh, observation that gets imported into VARS. And then we clean those up in VARS and validate those uh, using either VARS with uh, a video player that shows the localizations, the, the machine learning proposals, or we use GridView. And I'll show you those in just a second. But first, what I wanted to say is that, you know, there's a bit of a feedback loop here where, number one, you use training data, whether that's human generated or human validated machine learning proposals to train a model. You use that model to generate more proposals on new video or images. And then you clean that up again and train another model. So the whole point here is that through this feedback loop, your goal is that your human time is going to decrease and your model performance is going to improve over time. And so we actually saw that bear out um, with our localization process while we were creating these initially. It took us about a year and a half to create 100,000 localizations. And then once we got machine learning into the pipeline, it took about six months to create another 200,000 localizations. And then again, it's taken about four more months to create another 137,000 localizations. So this is Imbari data. Much of this has gone into FathomNet already. It, 
it will go into FathomNet in the future as well. It'll just keep sort of flowing into FathomNet. But right now we've got about 437,760 localizations in Ambari's training data set. So back to tools, um, we can use the VARS annotation with Shark to put a two video player app to actually localize uh, video. So this is actually video here. We've stopped on a frame and we can draw boxes on that. So we don't even need to use VARS localize now to call up still images. We can just be reviewing video and creating training data while we're doing that. But Shark to put a two also allows us to uh, visualize the machine learning proposals from models as well. And so that's what you're seeing there. And then also um, we can use uh, grid view for validating those machine learning proposals as well. So we can call up uh, a particular class or a particular dive, bring all those regions of interest up in a grid view, and then select each one of those, sort them in a variety of ways and edit the boxes and edit those class labels or delete class labels when they're inappropriate. Oftentimes these models right now are, um, they're making proposals on things like bubbles and bolts on the uh, ROV's arms. And so we delete those, but this allows us to do that very quickly and very easily. And then we've also integrated a model into our VARS application as well. So we can stop on a frame and click a button and send that frame to a model and then get those proposals back to us in real time. And then from there, we can either edit those or save them or uh, save the image. And that becomes, again, new trading data within VARS. So recently we did sort of a test of this entire workflow. We ran um, 18 dives, 135 hours worth of footage through the system that generated about 200,000 annotations and localizations. Um, the amazing thing is it took about five days of compute time on AWS and only cost about $300 to generate all that data. It then took about four months of human time uh, to validate that. But I think the important thing to note here is that each one of our video lab staff is currently annotating about 140 hours per year. So you can see right off the bat, the cost benefit here is going to be pretty significant when um, you know we start incorporating machine learning into this process. It's going to speed things up and make it much, much, much less expensive. And, and Lonnie, I just think it's important yeah. to emphasize, right, the number of people that are in the video lab versus this effort here, which involved, I think, you to do the human validation, correct? Uh it was really me and Giovanna in many cases. And then um, for certain groups like Midwater, we've had Midwater folks do it as well. But yeah, it's a very for small- Paul's very expedition. Small. I'm just, I think it's yeah. important to make that distinguish or distinguish those things, right? Whereas I think the video, how many people are in the video lab now? Probably? I think there's five of us now. Mm -hmm. for, the Paul, for the Paul dives, it was mostly me and a little bit of help from Larissa. I don't think you worked on that. Did you, Giovanna? Yeah, so it was mostly me. Um, Part-time, this wasn't full-time. Yeah, there were some long days there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, but again, but I yeah. think this, these numbers, you need to make sure that they are, um, you're comparing yeah, So that's a, a single person. And then, so more recently, we ran a single dive, which was much lower hours, uh, generated much less annotations, but that was really fast. That was like a couple of days, maybe less than a week to, to clean up that single dive. So this process is only going to get faster and faster and, and cheaper and cheaper for us. It's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, another example is this um, Pisivore Cam project. And the goal of this project is really to study marine predators in the open ocean. We're using uh, long range AUVs with both forward and aft mounted video cameras uh, and an attractor. It's basically like a fishing lure to see if we can att attract predators to it just so we can observe behavior. Don't want to get into how that changes behavior, but um, that's what we're doing. So we record the entire daylight portions of these seven to 10 AU, uh, seven to ten day AUV missions. Each one's about 300 kilometers in length and record about 200 hours worth of HD video, video per deployment. Uh, and then it also logs all this physical data that the AUVs are recording. 
uh, the main question from the PI was, hey, how can we rapidly find the good parts? Because what he was doing in the past was he was just scrubbing through the videos one by one, frame by frame, to try to find where any interesting uh, events occurred. And so I came up with this process where we would just rapidly iterate through machine learning models where with each new uh, mission, we'd grab some more data, retrain a model, and successively improve the performance of that model. Uh, once we got a pretty decent model running, we ran inference uh, one frame per second and then save all those crops. Uh, the crops are the ROIs that are just saved off as images. And then I just simply created a web table that put the crops and video information into a table so I could quickly visually see uh, where those interesting events occurred and what they were. And then I can also click on a link that takes me right to the video queued up uh, so I can review it really quickly. And the results of this are in 2023 alone, we had 10 missions, a total of 65 days. That's about 2000 kilometers, both inside and outside Monterey Bay. We found 11 species of fish, including sharks and salmon, um, four species of mammals, lots of birds. And again, this is non-quantitative, but it's rapid analysis. You know, he wants us to quickly figure out what we've seen and where. It's not quantitative. We're going to see duplicates in there, um, but it does very quickly go through this video. In fact, it takes about 24 hours on my local computer here to run through 200 hours of video. And it takes me about roughly a day to basically review all the proposals and find those interesting moments. So that's a shot of the AUV there. And uh, here's just some examples of the video that these are recording. We even saw a white shark this past year. Finding tuna, birds. I think the birds are really interesting because the model is able to detect birds both flying underwater and on the surface. You know, it's identifying bird feet. Schools of fish like those uh, anchovies, jellies, marine mammals like sea lions and, and dolphins. So it's pretty successful for me. It's a great project because it gets me to sort of test a lot of different ways of doing this really quickly, like the rapid model training and just kind of pushing the boundaries, which we can't really do within, within the VARS framework, which is a little bit more constrained. So again, this project allows us to develop, uh, to develop a process for rapid model iteration and improvement. We processed 600 hours worth of footage in 2023. In 2024, we plan to integrate all of this with VARS so that the images and everything is, are preserved within the VARS database and can become new training data for uh, Video Lab. And also that data could go into FathomNet and uh, I think that's it. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Angus. I, but um, yeah. I have something to add to this. Okay. Um, I just think it's it's helpful context for those of you that are here. Um, I mean, really what we've been doing uh, in collaboration with, you know, some of our partners at Ocean Vision AI, you know, that includes C-Vision and Angus, what we've been trying to do as a team is kind of workshop and develop solutions, iterate on them, um, and then come up with solutions that we think are gonna be very beneficial and tra transformational for the community. And then the idea is to integrate these, these features and approaches into the portal, mm -hmm. um, making that, uh, you know, these capabilities accessible to a, a much more broader community. Um, and so everything that Lonnie showed you, right, there's a lot of, Thought, especially within the VARS uh, work workflows, like a lot of iteration on how do you review these proposals, how do you interact with them and make changes, and it's it's that kind of UI work that we're hoping to export into the portal. And so I'm hoping the next FathomNet workshop will be able to show you uh, more about what the portal can and can offer and do. So with that, I'll hand it over to Angus. And I think just, you know, be thinking about, um, you know, what barriers are preventing you from using this and how you see using this in your work and how we can help you with that. Stop sharing. Okay. 
All right, Angus. Hi, everyone. I haven't prepared any slides for this breakout session specifically. Uh, my students do have some slides with technical details about Fathom GPT and the programmers group. I'm happy to share those if people are interested. But um, I was more, honestly, more interested in getting feedback from you. And if that's appropriate, I have a few questions to ask you. And then if you have questions for me or more questions broadly or more thoughts about AI in gen general and these, these tools, um, I see there's a question from Astrid already, um, which I can't answer. Um, but um, does someone want to answer Astrid's question now, or should I just keep going with my questions? Um, Angus, just continue, and we'll okay. answer them in the chat. Okay. Hey, Astrid. Um, great. So, yeah, I mean, my main question is, Fathom, that's, Fathom GPT has been a, a really fun project to work on and to think about how to interface with a scientific database like Fathom, that especially one that's so rich in imagery and rich in annotations and rich in metadata. Um, we think it lowers the barrier to entry to, to ask a, a wide range of questions from this database, which obviously there's an API, which is fantastic. And some people have access to SQL directly, which is fantastic. But having a natural language interface seems like it can open up a lot of possibilities and maybe, maybe simplify some research tasks or analysis tasks or data gathering tasks. Um, and so one of the qu questions I, ha I'm, I have is how are people queer using FathomNet right now in their research pipelines or their data exploration pipelines? Um, and a follow-up from that is how can a tool which provides a natural language interface with the functionality you saw and potentially additional functionality will, will be added, how can a tool like this support uh, your work? And maybe it can't. I mean, maybe one, I mean, one obvious answer might be, well, if it's still hallucinating a certain percentage of the time, we would never use it. Um, or maybe the answer might be, you know, it, it's a good first pass at gathering lots of information, and then we'd follow up with a more rigorous uh, querying. So I guess I just want to get some feedback on that. If it's something that maybe we, we can't answer right now, I've obviously made this form that I would, would love people to fill out. But that's kind of a basic question is, one, how are people using FathomNet? And two, how can a tool like Fathom GPT enable uh, those use cases? I think Astrid has a question. Hey, Astrid. Yeah, um, I was just messing around with uh, the FathomNet GBT. Um, and one thing I got really excited about when you were talking about it is the potential for basically like a lookup um, where you're annotating and you're like, ah, oh, there's this jelly and it, I can describe it and I can't, it's on the tip of my mind, but I don't know what it is. Can I write in a description of what I see and get some options, right? So I, I wanted to test that functionality. So I, I had, um, you know, mitrochoma um, as a jelly in mind. And so I was like, okay, it's a deep living, what did I write it? I wrote like deep living, uh, mostly transparent jelly north from the Northeast Pacific that has four white lines in it. And I wanted to see if it would come back with the jelly I was thinking of. Um, and so I think that would be awesome for, for training up students, for training up annotators, because we have tools like Ambari's Deep Sea Guide, but you have to kind of know already what you're looking for to be able to use that. And so having a tool where I can write in a description and get some um, even like larger taxonomic like guesses to go to something like the Deep Sea Guide to look at um, would be really a great tool for uh annotators and training up new annotators. Uh, thank you. So that means this is a case where you wouldn't have an image example. You just have some knowledge about it, various features and or or habitat or things like that. I mean, it would be it, I, you could put images and I guess you could take a screen grab and, and upload the screen grab, um, but it would be nice to just write a quick description and see what you could get back. Um, hmm. But yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you could just take a screen grab and then try to upload that. Um, it was interesting that um, 
when I asked, I kind of gave up because I couldn't find it and then put in um, like, what do you know about my trachoma or something? And it, and it gave me a totally incorrect answer. Incorrect? Um, yeah. So it, it yeah. Um, told me it was a sea gooseberry, a Tina for a comb jelly and, <laughs> and all kinds of, so it was, so I was, I just wanted to bring up my five minutes ago experience Fantastic. and what I would think was, would be useful as a use case. So, um, I'm just, we do have, uh, as, uh, Amy, you, my student is explaining the programmers group. One of the ways we're doing this kind of feature lookup is by gathering information from Wikipedia and also from the worms database. And um, we create a kind of a, a knowledge graph of the prompt and match it to this larger knowledge graph that we've created ahead of time. And the concepts we're, we're um, looking for now are kind of basic um, morphology. Does it have fins? Does it have tentacles? Color? Where it lives? And also a little bit about predator-prey relations. Are there other concepts that you think would be useful? I mean, when I heard you um, describing the um, mitochromia, it sounded like kind of visual features that you were describing. Is there other type of information that you would be wanting to use to, to get for, uh, to, to aid that lookup? Well, I don't know how easy this is because one of the big things we use is uh, the way things swim or mm. move. And so that would be video based, right? That's not, um, I just, I came into uh, the video annotation world in the midwater from from like the benthic. So I, I had to start from scratch basically. And so the process of me learning how to annotate those where I would talk to folks that were really experts, they'd be like, oh, well you look at, you know, if it swims kind of like this or if it um, flaps and then spins or, you know, and those were really tools that people were describing to me to look at in video for annotation. And so that's hard if we do everything based off of stills, um, but I think it's important eventually. Yeah, thanks. I don't, we haven't uh, tried to um, work with video data at all so far in, in Fathom GP, but that's an obvious next step to look at. And you're right, I don't quite off the top of my head know how we'd text, uh, you know, in language describe motion. So, but maybe the, if there is a kind of a, 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 a code for describing or, or common descriptors that describe motion, that would be really interesting. Um, so maybe we'll follow up with you if that's okay. I see someone else has their, Matt Marr has their hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you for this uh, presentation so far. It's really cool. Um, but so I had a question about the, uh, about the Fathom GPT because, so I was trying a, a query where I just thought I'd go very general. I said, search or show me the best images of a chimera. Um, and then it gave me uh, multiple photos of the same species, which was Heriata relehana, the, the narrow nose chimera. And then I was wondering if um, I find like what's really useful sometimes with ChatGPT or other uh, search functions is when you can rely on the memory of the model. So I can say like, uh, great, like the one I was looking at earlier, can you give me some details about it? Yeah, that kind of thing? And so in this case, I tried to ask it, what is its common name? to see if it knew the output that it gave me. Um, and the answer I was given was the common name for Chimera, which was my previous query. And I'm just wondering if, is there any sort of possibility for it to recognize its own output, even in, in like image form? Um, there's certainly supposed to be, uh, you know, a, a context window that keeps track of everything you've typed in. Um, if you're asking about if it remembers the image you the images you you've already uploaded after the fact, maybe a few questions later, I'm I'd have to defer to my or more just in this specific case, it was that I had asked for general images of a chimera. It gave me a photos of one species, mm. and then so I asked, "What is the common name of this species?" And then mm. it didn't know the common name of the species it showed me, but it gave me the common name of a chimera, which I asked earlier. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. As everyone who's played with the GPT, it seems super bright at certain points and then bizarrely incapable at other times, right? You just provided that information for me. How can you not know what you just provided me? So, um, though, but those are examples where some basic fine tuning would help a lot. So, 
I mean, just the fact that you've now asked that question, we can go through and make sure that there's a sequence of interactions with Fatim GPT and, and give it kind of a, a, a base exam, working, correcting, correct example that will then hopefully ideally be generalizable to other people asking similar questions. So the more feedback we get about, you know, how you're gonna use it and what questions you'll ask and pointing out where it breaks lets us fine tune it so that it doesn't break in the future. But um, yes, it, it should have knowledge of the context, but you know, there's blind spots and it forgets things and it's all the issues with the GPT. Again, we're using GPT 3.5 in most cases to kind of speed things up. Um, and for, uh, in GPT-4 and 4.5 Turbo, that memory is much, much better. So maybe what we can do is even potentially make an option where you can decide which one, which pipeline you want to use. If you want to use a 3.5 API because you're just asking general questions, and then when it fails, either we could automatically oops, did Matt disappear? Uh, we could automatically um, fall back to four. The thing is, sometimes we don't know when it fails. So maybe having an, a, a, a switch where a user could um, decide if it's using 3.5 or, or, or 4 or some other model uh, would be a good idea. And then, so, so then in that case, then if, if I, I think you mentioned this earlier as well, it's like if uh, it gives me an output that isn't quite correct and I tell it back that um, I think it should be this instead, uh, does, does that get saved just to the chat that I'm working with or is that uh, now informing the model itself? Uh, right now, it does not inform the model itself. It should okay. remember that in that session you're working with. Gotcha, okay. But there's no functionality to kind of remember that forever. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, I mean, what we're doing is we're logging the interactions people are having with Fathom GPT. So ideally, we're going through those and, and realizing, oh, this isn't fine-tuned yet. We should go ahead and uh, keep track of that. But as more users, use Fathom GPT, obviously we, we won't be able to, we can't scale to like look at every single interaction. So I'm, I'd am i have to think through how that might work, but that is a great idea to be able to say, hey, I'm the expert. I want you to add this to your knowledge base in the future. Thank you. Suggestion. Um, just a couple more questions, if if you don't mind. Um, um, so again, in the, in the, uh, form. I'm I'm really looking for kind of more examples of these use cases that will help us fine tune. If you can think of any, feel free to comment now or enter them in the form. Um, and uh, specifically interested in what kinds of natural language prompts you think would be useful to your work. What would you like to be able to type in to get something that would be useful for your research? And then, uh, lastly, we're you know we're kind of experimenting with this Plotly library where it can create interactive visualizations on the fly. And it works in some simple cases. And we are experimenting with, if it gets it wrong, can you say, no, I didn't mean that axis. I meant, you know, put, put oxygen levels on the Y axis, not the Z axis, not the X axis, or I'd like a 3D plot instead of a 2D plot. And it is pretty good at adjusting, but it's not perfect. So one question I have for this community is what type of visualizations are you familiar with? And do you, would you like to see, would you like to be able to prompt for? using the FathomNet data. Um, so if anyone has any ideas about that, please feel free to comment or enter it in the form. And I saw someone had their hand up. Maybe I believe it's Jasper, yeah. Hi, yeah, that was that was me. This is actually not about um, the, the GPT though. So if other people have questions about that, I'll let them ask that first. Um, I have kind of one follow-up question on the chat GBT. I'm still like playing with it with this one uh, example, um, but asking something like with a picture, what are a few possible species names? Do you think that is a, you like, is that something we should, um, is that a wording that's better than what is this? So that we get a couple of options, that, so that chat GBT returns multiple options as opposed to having to select one, which may yeah. or may not be correct based on, you know, what it's working with. I think that's a great phrasing. And again, we, we haven't fine tuned it to recognize that phrasing, but now that you said that, 
we can go ahead and do it. So obviously that information is in the database because we can just do a similarity search, figure out the images, and then look up what the name of the species is and collect you know, the top five or whatever, and then present them back to, to the user. So if it's not working right now, we would just update our fine tuning mechanism and train it so it recognizes a query precisely like that. And again, GPT is pretty amazing at generalizing. So once we have one example where we can show the question and the proper um, SQL query and then transformation of the result of the SQL query to what we want it to look like in the interface, then it will work for ideally any species that you ask or any image you upload. So that's yeah, a thing. So an, an interesting good. result was just from the same image uploaded with what is this species, it gives one answer. And then what are a few possible species names for this actually gives six options that don't include that first option, which is interesting. But I, I do think that having something like that, gen, give me like five guesses, 10 guesses, what you think this is would be really useful, um, especially for things that, that like jellies that can look very similar to other things based on their orientation in the specific picture. I think having, giving that flexibility um, would be really cool. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to kind of jump in just to ask, um, also just going back to like not able to find a common name. Um, so I guess based on my understanding of how, um, how Fathom GPT like gathers information from FathomNet and from Wikipedia and other sources. Is it maybe, I think this is more a question to Angus, is it maybe not finding a common name because it's not directly in the FathomNet database? So for example, right now, a lot of animals might be in like family and taxonomic specific things. And is it maybe just in one, two, I think a lot of deep sea animals don't really have common names. <laughs> um, so is it maybe a combination of those things as to why it might not be able to find a common name? Is it just because it, it's trying to find which source to pull it from? Uh, yeah, I think that's certainly one reason. And we've been focusing on going from common name to scientific name because that's how the images are stored inside FathomNet. Um, they're not stored by common name and and in different regions of the world there's different common names so uh we i would guess that it's less accurate going from scientific name to common name um, but i haven't tested that out and if that is something that's useful we can um uh, we can we can look into again fine tuning for that kind of reverse uh, uh lookup or reverse resolution i guess I think that's a good point, Giovanna, because for the vast majority of these animals, we don't, they don't have common names. They just don't exist. Yeah, like chimeras, for example. Yeah, I feel like there, there's many common names that I've heard. Um, and it's like, there's like some people call them ghost sharks. Um, I forget the other common names, but there's definitely, I feel like a lot of common names that are used for different species. Um, I think ghost sharks and ratfish are the most common names, and but really the only common name I know for a ratfish that's like official is um, the spotted ratfish. Maybe Ray Trolls ratfish too. Um, there is uh, some other suggestions in the chat. <clears throat> um, like dropping a screenshot from an ROV video. Um, uh, and then also if query targets exist in an annotation set in FathomNet or other repositories, it would be good for Fathom GPT to point you at it. Um, so show us the results on FathomNet, let's say. So the first one is a screenshot from a... I think you started to show that towards the end of, I mean, not the pattern matching, so to speak, but, you know, like if you have a screen grab from, you know, your video or something, um, and then indicating that this is something you want to look at, um, and giving, a, I guess, a couple examples of what that thing might be, um, would be really helpful. I mean, there's some things we had, we thought about, but haven't uh, fine tuned on yet. Um, right now, we're we a lot of the searches can be constrained by depth, for example. But there's other information. Some of the uh, ROVs collect, I guess, salinity and oxygen level. I showed a few examples of that, but that's not something we've 
I don't know if people search by oxygen level or by salinity. You know, so if there are specific things that are use some of the scientific data that's stored in FathomNet, um, that would be good to know. Probably depth. Depth, okay. Does anyone but, else have questions or comments? Do you have more questions for people, Angus? I mean, one thing I, I playing with, you know, natural language interfaces and GPT over the last 10 months or so is that it is a different type, different way of interacting with data. And it is, there's something uncanny about it that it, you know, you have to ask the same question in two different ways, or if it gets it wrong, you can tell it it got it wrong and maybe it'll get it right. And have to take everything with a slight grain of salt so it's a little odd and but on the other hand it's so flexible and so powerful and you get these kind of serendipitous things and you, you're able to in a single session go down different pathways of exploration that you wouldn't think to do if you were just writing an api api call or writing a you know complex sql query so yeah i want to get this out to people and just see how people use it and hopefully make it more and more robust in the in the near future um and I, cause I think that is the one thing that's holding us back is like, what, how do people want to use this? And if we know that we can fine tune it so that it supports that. And that's really the bottleneck right now. I think more than any, I mean, there's technological issues as well, but the main bottleneck is how can we support users get trying to get the information they want to get out of FathomNet. And I think Kakani, you mentioned that there was a comment about other, other databases that could somehow match or join on to the FathomNet databases that would be useful as well. That could be an interesting possibility for the future. I mean, right now it's definitely geared at this one FathomNet database, but potentially could load in other data sources as well. So I guess I have two questions about the results that are uh, displayed. Number one, is there a plan in the future for that to be downloadable? so that you do a search by image similarity, whatever, you can download that data set directly from that interface. Same thing with the data that makes up those plots. Uh, yes, that that is a good idea. Um, I mean, right now we have the SQL query, so you could, pretend, if you had access to the SQL database, you could just copy and paste it and get that data. Mm -hmm. um, there are cases where that data is transformed in some way, and there could be an easier way to save it as a CSV file or something like that. And certainly for the visualizations, I mean, they're not working quite as well. So we, I haven't thought through how you can maybe cut and paste it as a figure for a paper or, you know, be able to change it uh, manually as opposed to using the Fathom GPT interface. But that's a great idea. And an, an, an obvious next step is to figure out how to get it off of the interface so it's usable by other tools. Yeah, I'm just thinking like there might be an example where, you know, somebody wants to train a model on red fish. And so they could just do a similarity search for red fishes, download that training data set, and they're like ready to go. Oh, cool. <clears throat> so Kakani, are there plans to integrate that into the main FathomNet search? So you could do something like show me all the red fish and those come up within the FathomNet interface. And then you could actually, you know, correct localizations there and do things like that. Yeah, I mean, that the idea is we want to integrate this with the FathomNet website. We haven't decided yet exactly how that will be implemented. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the Explore page, right? You, right now we have a search, and that search only accepts uh, names of objects that are in the FathomNet database. Right. Um, so I can definitely see how that um, search bar can perhaps change. Like it, you yeah. select a Fathom Net or Fathom GPT option, and then it'll just allows natural language queries. Mm -hmm. um, or like, same thing where you do that image match, where you can upload an image and say, find all the images that match this. That'd be so cool. Yeah. So I think right now, most likely the the lower lift implementation would be a separate, you know, like a a linked page within Fathom Net that mm -hmm. allows you to to essentially use that UI that Angus was sharing. But we're we're trying to get, I mean, as we've talked about this, we're trying to get this potentially off of the servers in your lab onto something that um, also has a little bit more bandwidth too. So that's upcoming. 
there's a lot to do. <laughs> well, thank you for the, the feedback and feel free to, again, fill in the form or contact me directly. I'll, I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, if you have any suggestions for features or if something breaks and you're annoyed by it, let me know. Or if there's a use case you want us to try and add into the uh, into the uh, the software. Yeah, and I think Merlin, your question. I I've also noticed that sometimes the mapping from the taxonomic groups to the SQL query doesn't really work, um, and so I think that's something too. Angus's team was working on as well. Um, I mean, it's hard for humans to keep straight, so that makes sense. Be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, oh, that's a great, Robert, that's a really great suggestion. So I think um, there's, so we've talked a little bit about this within our internal team. You know, right now, Angus is pulling data primarily from FathomNet, but, you know, over time, you could imagine pulling other resources like, um, you know, the the marine species traits that you see on marine species.org, um, which is worms, right? Um, or pulling in the species uh, identifiers and features that are in the smarter ID, um, you know, lists as well. Uh, and then, you know, you could even go deeper within the marine species uh, or within worms, you can actually potentially pull the original descriptions, like the descriptive papers, um, and and provide more information uh, to these tools that Angus's team has been developing. So again, maybe in that feedback, provide some other ideas for potential sources of information that could be used to fine tune Fathom GBT. Okay, great. Well, we do have five more minutes. I don't know if Lonnie, you have anything. Um, it, it might be worth, I think, from this group, right, you you shared details on the different data, sorry, the different uh, machine learning models that we're hoping to curate and retrain uh, multiple times a year. We don't know what that cadence will be yet. It's really dependent on new data. Um, and so those four models are the the Meg detector or Meg Ladon detector, which is a bit of a joke. Um, the... VME. Uh, the vulnerable marine ecosystems object detector. Um, and then the two other models are the benthic and midwater super category detectors. That's and correct. I, and I think from this group, I'd be really curious, like, you know, are these models potentially valuable or useful? Could you see other models that um, could also be really beneficial? Because what we're trying to do is, is cover at least the, the general use cases um, that you know, we expect the community would have. Um, but if there are others that we're missing, I think that would be helpful for us to know. And also just circling back, um, I think Jasper had a question. Jasper, I don't know if you still have a question or maybe it was answered. Yeah. Um, so my question, it wasn't answered. It was uh, very specifically about Fathomverse. So this is probably more for the people, the team that are working on that. Um, so I was looking at the, uh, you know, the expert um, taxonomist doing uh, video content for you guys. I was looking for that form and I, I think it's really interesting. So my question for you guys is um, as far as people who are coming into the Fathomverse game and have very little background um, in, in uh, any identification of organisms at all, like at best they could tell that that's a fish and that would be about as far as they could get. What type of um, sort of stuff are you doing to help those sorts of people? Um, because I know a lot of people like in my life would love to be involved in this, but if I sent them to this game, they'd be like, I don't even know where to start. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how you guys are helping people get um, involved in that. Um, I just am really passionate about like citizen science and public education. So I'd love to just hear more from you guys. Yeah, we've, we put a lot of effort into that actually. Um, so I think the the very first walkthrough I shared uh, shows the mission briefings. Um, and so the intention of those mission briefings are to be, uh, frankly, educational. Um, 
So highlighting what are the important features that distinguish that particular group with others, um, highlighting the different animals that are representative members of that particular group, but then also providing examples of different animals that could be confusing um, or are often confused for those animals in that animal group. The other thing the game does is it provides feedback. Um, so remember, Fathomet data is sprinkled into the game uh, at random. So the game player doesn't actually know what they're, if, if the image they're looking at is labeled or if that image is unlabeled. Um, and so what that means is we can very quickly get give people, um, like we can give instant feedback on how well the game players are annotating um, you know, images that are already labeled. Um, and so that feedback is provided at the completion of a dive. And so you can see that the feedback includes, do you get it right? Did you get it wrong? Um, did you miss it? So like if that animal was in the dive and you didn't collect it and you saw it, that's also highlighted. Um, that's an important number actually for recall or boosting recall of, of the game players. And so it's that those three pieces of information that we provide, um, but not only on the label data, what we do is once Im unlabeled images reach consensus, those consensus labels are pushed to the game and then um, displayed to the game player in terms of, you know, were they, were they, did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Um, and so we're, we're con by continually giving this feedback, the hope is that we are uh, then improving the performance of the game player. That's really great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And just another quick note to add to that. Also, I think the way that the game was designed when when users just start out, there's sort of like a training mode. And so there's a period where the users can sort of just kind of get the hang of like, okay, like I'm going to do a jelly um, mission briefing. And then again, they can learn a little bit of like the, just some of the key features of jellies and then learn and then sort of kind of progress in that progress. So there's a bit of a progression before, you know, they start um, doing more labels. So it's kind of like a small steps to get there. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, um, we're out of time and then I completely forgot to send a reminder. Uh, so let's head back to the, the main room.